Welcome to Living Word Ministries with our director and Bible teacher, Debbie Blank. Debbie's passion is for you to understand and apply God's truths to your life. Now let's listen and enjoy teaching from the Word of God with Debbie Blank. Oh, curios, theos, that's God, the Almighty, El Shaddai, the All-Sufficient One. That's what the word Almighty means, the All-Sufficient One. If God's all-sufficient, can you trust him in everything? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. These people have been martyred, and they trusted God in everything, and they're rejoicing certainly because they're in heaven, but they're rejoicing that God allowed them to be martyred. Next time something happens in your life, will you rejoice over it? And when you go to our Kyrios Theos El Shaddai, because he's the one who can take care of you. And then he goes on in verse 3 to say, Righteous and true are thy ways, thou king of the nations. Two character qualities that we three see throughout the book of Revelation. God is righteous and he's true. His ways are righteous and it's true. And I thought, okay, ways means the path that God has designed. His path that he has designed is righteous and true. So who are you and I to say to God, why did you do this to me, God? But we do. First thing I ever did research on when I became a believer is, why me? (laughs) Because we always go, why me, God? I try and follow you, I do everything right, or I try to, and, and then you allow this to happen. We, if we know God, If we know God's plans, if we trust his ways, his paths, we know they are righteous and we know they are true, even though we don't understand them. What she said is, if we realize, as she does, that God knows the big picture, we don't. He knows what's best for us. He knows what's best in the long run. He knows his plan and his purpose. And I got to tell you that even though I think things look good, if it's not in God's plan, I don't want to do it. You know, I had a friend recently, actually when I had children, after not being able to have children for 10 years, when we finally had children, um, I prayed from the beginning, God, do not let that child be born if, if he or she does not know you as his Lord or Savior. And I've prayed that for several people. And when God allows us to have grandchildren, I'll pray for that grandchild. Do I want a grandchild? You bet I do. Did I want a child? You bet I did. But it's more important to me that they love Jesus Christ than that they come into this world. Because otherwise, it's, they're destined for hell. So let's keep our focus where it needs to be, and that's on God. These people had their focus on God. That's why they said in verse 4, You, God, uh, excuse me, who will not fear, O Lord, Kurios, and glorify thy name? And, and let's just stop there again. With everything we know about God, who wouldn't fear God? Who wouldn't glorify his name? Well, a whole bunch of people. I mean, 89% of the adults in America who don't have a biblical worldview. 100% of the people in the rest of the tribulation that we're going to read about because they are going to blaspheme God. How can people see what God has done? How could the Israelites see what he did in the Dead Sea and not worship him and not see him as being God and in charge? How can we get up every morning with breath in our, bone, in our bodies and life and not see what God has done for us? The reason is we take things for granted. We just, you know, we live in America. We have the American dream. So we take everything for granted. We, we can't take anything for granted. The word for fear here is phobios, which can mean a reverential fear or a be afraid. It can mean either one. I would say in the context here, who would not be afraid of God? And, and it's a reverential, but it's also, I'd be afraid of God's judgment. You know, it's coming upon them. They've already seen it. it they're going to continue to see it. I'd have a fear in me that would draw me toward recognizing somebody out there is in control, which is kind of both fears. I'd be afraid enough to draw me to God. For example, my father was a great man, great man. I phobiosed him. I mean, I feared him with a reverential fear that I trusted that everything he said and did was right because he really was a righteous man. And I fortunately had a very good role model for man. But 
when I did something wrong, Debbie, you know, I heard that, and fear. I was afraid. What's going to happen to me? So I had both of those reactions to my dad, and I can see that here, people being afraid for what God is going to bring upon them, as well as a reverential fear of him. So we go on to say then in verse 4, who will not phobo, phobio, or be afraid or reverentially fear curio, curos, excuse me, curios, and glorify his name, honor his name, honor his character. For you alone, God, are holy, holy. Now, we've seen the, name, the word holy in here a lot. We see it a lot through scripture. And it, it usually is um, hagios. That's not what this word is. It's hosios. And I went, I've never heard of hosios holiness before. What is that? It's divine holiness. God says in the Old Testament, be holy as I am holy. Here he doesn't say that because people here are going to see God's divine holiness. Something you can't see apart from God is his divine holiness. For all the nations will come and worship before thee. For thy righteous acts have been revealed. Wow. What a great worshipful time for these people as they recognize God's works are great, his ways are great, his name is great. They say all of these things here. And because of that, the time is now coming when all the nations are going to come and worship before you. Prostate, fall down and prostate themselves before God in reverential worship. For thy righteous acts, which actually the King James says, judgments. For thy judgments have been revealed. But it's not the judgments that he's going to pour out on these sinners in the bold judgments. Instead, when he talks about his righteous acts or his judgments being revealed, he's talking about the product of being justified by God. In other words, believers, those who have been believers in God, who are products of being justified by him, have been revealed. They're in heaven, and they're worshiping him. Now, stopping here for a minute, here we are in just a few verses in chapter 15. We've seen horrendous things happen. We're going to see horrible things happen in chapter 16. But what does God give us here? A glimpse of himself, a glimpse of heaven, a glimpse of how people are willing to give up their lives joyously for following God and following his word. I love it. I mean, we have heavenly scenes in chapters 4 and 5. We see a few glimpses of God in heaven when the temple opened up. And now we're seeing heaven again before all hell breaks loose. The final hell breaks through on earth. How gracious is God in his mercy to let us see that. It's kind of like he's saying, okay, folks, open up your eyes. Even in the midst of all this hell, I'm here. I'm in charge. My arms are open. Come. Come to me. He never gives up on us. Until the last, well, the, the last person comes into his kingdom, he never gives up on anybody. Isn't that refreshing? All right, now we're going to look at verse 5 because this gives us a little understanding of the bowl judgments. After these things, I looked and the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened. Now, have we seen the temple in heaven before? We have. In chapter 11, verse 19, if you recall, it was open. It says... Um, The temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened, and the Ark of the Covenant appeared in his temple. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. And that was right in the middle, beginning of the middle of the tribulation. And now, right before the bowl judgments, we see heaven open up again, and the temple of the tabernacle in heaven was opened. Now, it's kind of interesting because Satan, if you recall, is in charge of of the world at this point. Uh, He's been thrown down under earth, knowing he has a short time. He's indwelt, I believe, the Antichrist. He's in power on the earth. I think what God is saying here is, yeah, but I'm still in power in the heavens, and I'm coming to take over the earth. I think that's his way of what he's saying, by letting the temple be open. 
And then verse 6 says, And the seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple, clothed in linen, clean and bright, and girded around their breasts with golden girdles. We're going to see a little bit about that regarding us when we get to chapter 19. This is how God is describing his angels to John. Now in verses 7 and 8 he says, And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the the thumos, wrath of God. It's time now for all of God's wrath to be poured out. His judgmental wrath, his action wrath poured out on man. And then it says, uh, The full wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Verse 8, And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God. That's interesting because if you go back in the Old Testament and you see the tabernacle when it was filled with the, with the glory of God, when you see the temple when it was first dedicated and filled with the glory of God, it said the glory of God was there, but it didn't mention smoke. This mentions smoke. Filled with the smoke, meaning, perhaps meaning the judgment that was coming. From the glory of God and his power. Now, interesting phrase. And no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Interesting statement. What does that mean? Could mean several things. It could mean that there's going to be no heavenly intercession, no worship, nothing's going to take place until all of this this is over. We've seen the worship earlier in this chapter. We saw it in chapters 4 and 5. We saw it in chapter 7. We've seen it elsewhere. It could mean that there's not going to be any worship. This is a solemn time. Nothing, no worship is going to take place until the bold judgments are over. Could mean that. It could mean it's a time of judgment, not rejoicing. Same idea there. People would still be in heaven, but they won't be rejoicing because it's a time of judgment. Not sure I agree with either one of those because I, you know, there's so much worship going on in heaven, even though judgment's coming. I I don't know. Not quite sure that I would agree with those. Possible. I don't know. It could mean that from here on out, no believers are going to die. Because it says no one's going to be able to enter the kingdom, enter the temple, until the seven plagues are over. No one is going to be able to enter the temple. This is where God is. So are they saying no one's going to be able to enter the no, uh, no believers are going to be able to enter the kingdom of God until the judgments are over. They're stuck on the earth for the rest of this time. It could. And then it could mean one final thing, and that is that from this moment forward, not one person is going to be saved until Christ returns. Now, that's, those last two ones are pretty sad to think about. When do we get to see God face to face? What is heaven like in the interim time until eternity starts in Revelation 21? Now, we know Revelation 21 and 22 is all about heaven, eternal heaven. But what is heaven like today? That's an interesting thing. Do we see God face to face? Or do we see Jesus face to face and not God on this throne? Interesting thing. And that's something you can do some of your own study and research on because we don't have time to talk about it in this class. But it's a good, good comment and a good question about that. So we don't quite know what this means, but if it means that no one is going to be saved from this time forward, um, that's a pretty devastating thing. Now remember, in chapter 14, right before this, the angel, first time an angel's ever shared the gospel, flew throughout the mid-heavens sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. I wonder if that was the last time that people will hear the gospel until Jesus returns. It's very possible, very possible, because we do not see the gospel being shared hereafter. And as a matter of fact, we see people turning away from God hereafter, which we're going to see now as we start in chapter 16. Now that we have the prelude to the bold judgments, we're going to go into those bold judgments. Verse 1. And I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the seven bowls of the thumos, the wrath of God, into the earth. Interesting. Catch anything interesting there? Not onto the earth. Into the earth. Interesting thought. Um, You know, I got to tell you, when I taught Revelation 14 years ago, I was really blessed with a whole week with my dad out of town because my kids and family had left and come back here. 
And all I did for that whole week was study and meditate on the book of Revelation. Wow. You do that, you really get a good feel for this book. That was 14 years ago. And I've read the book of Revelation since then. But reading it over again now, I keep getting new insights because the word is always living and active. Don't ever think because you've studied a book that you don't need to study it again. You're at a different place and God's word's living. So as I'm reading these, I'm thinking, wow, these bold judgments that have poured out are satanic, remember. We're in the last half of the tribulation. Everything is satanic. Certainly it can be God's judgments because the first four bold judgments are on nature. That's what God did in the trumpet judgments also. And then the last four are on people. But do you see the increase? What we're going to see here is the increase in intensity of each of these judgments over anything there's been before. So the first bowl judgment starts in verse 2. The first angel went and poured out his bowl into the earth, and it became a loathsome and malignant sore upon the men who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. Now, does this sound like anything we've seen before in the book of Revelation? In the fifth trumpet, in chapter 9, verse 5, in the fifth trumpet judgment, you might remember the abyss was open. And when it was, people were bitten by those scorpions, or what looked like a scorpion bite by a locust. And so it's, it's a similar idea. But these people, um, these people now have a loathsome and malignant. The other one was only for five months. This one's malignant. What does that mean? means you'll, you'll die from it. It's a judgment for those, but it's only those people that what? Have the mark of the beast, who have accepted the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. Now, they say that if, for example, we were, the mark of the beast was to be a lithium implant into your skin, apparently, I'm not a scientist, but I'm told, that lithium, when it, um, if it were to leak out, it would cause a huge sore that would very easily possibly give you cancer if it was in your system. Very interesting to think about that. Verse 3, now when we get to the second bowl, it says, And the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became blood like that of a dead man. And what happened? Every living thing in the sea died. Now, in the second trumpet, we saw the same thing happen, except there was a little bit different scenario. What was that? Okay, a third of the sea turned to blood. Now it's every living thing in the sea died. Do you see the intensity of things happening? There is a, a fungus, you might call it, called uh, testeria. It's a red dye, that, like type dye, that when it gets in the water, it boils fish alive. Uh, it's a th thousand times more toxic than cyanide. It's in existence today. If something like that got in the water, it would kill everything instantly. But remember, I say that. We're using human things to understand this. These, as always, as all the seal and the trumpet judgments are, these are bowls poured out from heaven onto the earth. God can use natural disasters, but God is causing this. God is allowing this. Verse 4, the third bowl. And the third angel poured out his bowl into the what? Rivers and springs of water. We saw that in the third trumpet judgment, that the rivers and springs of water had wormwood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, Righteous art thou who art and who was, O holy one, because you judge these things. For they poured out the blood of the saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. And then what they say? They deserve it. That sounds a little unchristian. <laughs> As a matter of fact, when I was reading that, I, I was reminded of a proverb. Uh, let me turn there. Proverbs 24. Uh, a very important proverb for us to remember. Not quite sure how it fits in here. But it says in Proverbs 24, 17, Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. That's what the Bible says. We're not supposed to want to get even with people. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. 
But the fact is, that's exactly what God's doing here. This is his vengeance. He is the one repaying. And so these people are rejoicing at what God is doing. Now, does that sound strange to you? Let's think about it. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Because in Matthew chapter 5, we have the Beatitudes that took place on the what we now call the Mount of Beatitudes, a beautiful location overlooking the, dead, the um, Galilean Sea up in the northern part of Israel. And Jesus said something that we're very familiar with in verse 4 when he gave his Beatitudes. He said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now we read that and we go, Okay, yeah, blessed are those who mourn for the death of a loved one. God's going to comfort them. He's going to take care of them. I don't believe that's what this means. In the context here, this is all about our heart attitude. It's not about life circumstances. So when he says, blessed are those who mourn, do you, do you have any idea what that mourn means? What's he talking about mourning over? Over our sins. What he's saying is, and I'm paraphrasing this, but blessed are those who see the things that are important to God, who have a heart for God, who desire to be walking with God and with him. And when we see life through God's eyes, then everything that happens that is sinful, that is evil, that is wrong, we mourn over. Whether it's our life, our country, our city, our family, other people, that causes us to mourn. I have a, a friend whose child got pregnant out of wedlock. And um, he was absolutely devastated. This was still in the era where it seemed to be acceptable. I mean, it was about 10 years ago. Uh, what really intrigued me about him was he was not mourning over the fact that his daughter got pregnant. He was, he was so upset because of what this did, how God saw this. He was mourning over the sin that his daughter had become involved in because she had offended and grieved God. He wasn't mourning over her circumstances. You see, if we're walking with God, we want what God wants. We desire what he wants and what, he, what they wanted here, God, what God is doing here is justice, judgment. And when we're mourning, when we're walking with God, and when we're, when we're rejoicing, in this case, as they're saying, they deserve it, it's because they're seeing life through God's eyes right now. They're seeing what God needs to do because of the sin on the earth. They're not doing to say, oh, good, get him, God. That's not what they mean. They just know God's heart. And that's why they're standing in oneness with God over this judgment. It's the angel who's ported out, and it's the angel who's saying these things. And the, so let's keep that in context here. The fact is, as we look at this, the angels know. They have God's heart. These are good angels. You have good angels and bad angels. They know God's heart, and they want what God wants here. The application still goes for you and I in that context. What do you mourn over, or do you mourn over? When you see people in our culture and in our country, you, I mean, if you saw what happened in California this week, where Governor Brown signed into law allowing transgender people to uh, be on the same athletic teams with people that they... Um, feel like they're a part of. So if a boy feels like he's a girl, he can be on their team, an athletic team, and he can shower in their shower rooms and he can use their restroom. He just signed that into law in California. It's happening all over the country. It's being considered here in Nebraska. And matter of fact, will be voted on in the next couple of weeks here in Nebraska. When you see things like that, do you just say, oh, it's a sign of the times. This is the way people are. Or do you say, oh, God, how grieved you are to see how much we've turned away from you and the truth of your word and the things we're doing to accommodate people instead of to accommodate the word of God. Now, understand, always understand, God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. God has a standard that he sets out, and no culture can change that standard. And when our culture does, then our cultures turn away from God, and God wants us to mourn over that sin. Now, looking at verse 7, it says, And I heard the altar saying, interesting, he hears the altar saying. doesn't hear the angel saying, he hears the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, El Shaddai, true and righteous are your judgments. We just saw that in chapter 15. 
And then the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and it was given to him to scorch men. And men were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has the power over these plagues, and they did not repent so as to give him glory. So, if you go back and check the trumpet judgments, you'll see that this sounds like the fourth trumpet. But it's more intense. It's more intense than that. And um, also, when I got to thinking about that, uh, I was given some information that you can find at uh, nasa.gov, N-A-S-A.gov. And if you type in either tsunamis or December 13, 2006, where you want to look at what the sun looked like on that particular day, there was a tsunami. It's called a moratone wave. And uh, it's, it's a tsunami-type shock wave that spread throughout the sun one million kilometers per hour, and it circled the entire sun in a matter of minutes, it said. So you can just imagine if that tsunami got out of the force field of the sun and made its way towards us, what it would do to us. Then you have to look at the solar flares. Right now, we're in, right in the middle of a huge solar flare period that will last until 2020. And there's a particular sunspot called AR-1654 that is being watched more than any of the other solar flares. Because if it reaches an M class, excuse me, if it reaches an X class solar flare, it will develop like an EMP bomb, electromagnetic pulse bomb, that will knock out all of our communications, all of our electricity. And what I'm told is that if that happens, 90% of the people in the United States will die. Thank you for joining us today on Living Word Ministries with Debbie Blank. Living Word Ministries is a listener-supported program. To contact Debbie Blank, you may do so at livingwordministry.org. That's www.livingwordministry.org. Please tune in each week at the same time for Living Word Ministries with Debbie Blank.